pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael S. Nyberg, Professor of History at the University of Southern Mississippi. Professor Nyberg is, is as I said, Professor of History and Co-Director of the Center for the Study of War and Society at the University of Southern Mississippi, and is the author or editor of nine books and numerous articles specializing primarily in World War I and the global dimensions of the history of warfare. His most recent books include Soldiers' Daily Lives in the 19th Century and also Fighting the Great War, a global history, which has been called the greatest single volume history of the First World War. Before coming to the University of Southern Mississippi, Dr. Nyberg taught at the United States Air Force Academy and at Carnegie Mellon University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Nyberg. Thanks. Thanks. Well, let me start by thanking Michael and Jesse and Tommy Sherd and everybody that uh, made this possible. It is a real honor to be here to do the Perspectives Lecture and to do it here in this room where I sat right by that light doing some of the research uh, that, that went into this book. So it's a real pleasure to be here. It is a real pleasure to be in my native state of Pennsylvania and, uh, and giving this talk here tonight. I'm going to talk about the Second Battle of the Marne. Um, and I came to this uh, subject through a rather odd way, through a cup of coffee with a gentleman by the name of Spencer Tucker, who's at Virginia Military Institute. And he was doing a series on 20th century battles. And he asked me what battle in the 20th century did I think most needed to be included in the series. And I answered somewhat you know, foolishly that there was no real scholarly book on Second Battle of the Marne except for Colonel Johnson's, uh, which focused on the American side at Soissons, but that there was no book on the whole battle. And Spence, first of all, talked me into writing the book and then he said, uh, well, why do you think that is? Why do you think nobody's looked at this battle before? And I gave an answer to him that in, in looking, looking back on, I'm rather embarrassed at. I said that this is a unique battle in that it's the only time in World War I that the Germans, Americans, French, and British are on the same battlefield in large numbers at the same time. And the answer I gave him was that I thought that nobody had thought about the battle in those terms and that it took kind of looking at four different armies to make that happen. And I said that I just didn't think that anybody had thought to do that. Military historians tend by nature to be a little bit nationalist in the way they look at things. Um, the British and French historians certainly tend to be that way. Uh, but the more I did this project and the more I did research on it, it occurred to me that that wasn't the reason at all that nobody had particularly looked at this battle. The reason I think uh, that nobody's really particularly looked at this is that this is a battle that defies every stereotype you have of World War I. There are no trenches at this battle. This is a battle that goes more or less to plan, at least for the Allies. Uh, this is a battle that involves a lot of movement, it involves a lot of fluidity, and it has a decision at the end. So in that regard, it's unlike the Somme, it's unlike Verdun, it's unlike Passchendaele, it's unlike even the Meuse-Argonne, these battles that we kind of look at and we say, well, what really came of this? What really happened? This is a battle that is decisive on the strategic sense. It's a battle that literally changes the way that World War I happens. So the more I worked on this project and the more I looked at sources, the more I thought, well, the real reason why no one's looking at this is that it doesn't fit the way we think about World War I. So what I want to do here with you tonight is introduce you to this battle and talk about some of the ways uh, that this battle is very different. Uh, if you go to the Second Marne battlefields, as I know Colonel Johnson has and some others have, they don't look like the battlefields at the Somme and Verdun. There are no trenches to walk through. There's no great reconstructed battlefield as there is at the Somme and at other places. Uh, because this is a battle that's hard to fix in space. It's a very big battle, as I'll show you. Um, and it's also, again, a, a battle that doesn't affect the landscape in the way that some of these other battles do. I put two images on this first slide, um, both of which I hope make a point. The top image is of uh, French tanks fighting at the Second Marne. Uh, this is a battle that armor and advanced weaponry are very important in. Um, it is, in that regard, a battle that, in my mind, looks much more like something out of, say, 1939 or 1940 than it does something out of 1914. Um, this is a, a, a way of showing how important this technology was, modern technology, modern methods of, of fighting war, um, modern doctrine, modern strategy, all of that uh, to, to this battle. The image on the bottom is of the small town of Feme, which is uh, across the Vale River in the Marne, um, you can see some of the destruction uh, that the battle caused there. That's part of the reason I put this up. Uh, Fiem is on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side is the town of Fiemet, which in French literally means small Fiem. Um, and across the Vale River, you can see the bridge there that was destroyed. 
If you go to Fiume today and you cross the Vale River into Fimet, you will walk over a bridge that has on it pictures of doughboys, and it is dedicated to the 28th Infantry Division, which is, of course, the keystone or the iron division of men from Pennsylvania. It was Pennsylvania men who liberated this town uh, in World War I. So I chose that as the, the second image here. And we were talking at dinner about the great memorial at Varennes uh, to the Pennsylvanians. This is not very far from that. OK, the context for this battle um, exists in, in what happens in 1918, when the Germans launch uh, a massive assault on the Western Front that begins on March 21st, 1918, um, in an effort to win the war before the United States can begin to send large numbers of men over to France. And as most of you probably know, um, they conquer everything that's in these kind of pink shades that are uh, on this map right here. In general, um, they are attempting to go for the area right around the town of Amiens, which is uh, right there. Uh, Amiens is the break point between, or, or the merge point, I should say, uh, between the British and French armies. North of Amiens, it's all British. South of Amiens, it's, it's French. The idea, in theory, is that you cause a break right here, the thinking being that if the British panic, they'll do what the British do, and they'll go towards seaports. And that if the French panic, they'll do what they should do, and they'll come south, and they will try to cover Paris. This is the theory, at least. Um, in reality, the Germans don't do quite so good a job. They never put enough pressure on Amiens um, to make this happen. What it does, however, is a couple of very important things, these campaigns. Uh, the Germans do take all of this territory here, which is remarkable by First World War standards, really, really remarkable by First World War standards. Um, it creates two very important um, things for the Second Battle of the Marne. The first thing that it does is lead to a meeting in the town of Doulans, which is up here somewhere, right about there, um, of all of the Allied commanders, um, not the American. Pershing's not at this meeting. But at the Doulans meeting, um, they all get together. And what they do is they finally decide, after months and months and months of arguing and wrangling about this question, that the Western Front for the Allies needs one commander, that the British can't run their war, the French can't run their war, the Americans can't run that, their war. There needs to be a single commander for the Western Front. And they show up at Doulans, which is close enough to the front line that they can hear the artillery shells um, uh, that the Germans are firing in their general direction. They meet in the town hall of Doulon. The room is still there. There's a big mural on the wall to commemorate this occasion. And they sit down and they think about who they're going to name to this very important job of overall commander in chief. They all know it has to be a Frenchman, because so much of the front line is French. And as you can see here, the French have 100 infantry divisions in the field. The British have 58. So it's going to go to a Frenchman. Uh, the British at first are in favor of Henri Philippe Pétain, about whom you'll hear more later. When they show up at Zoulon, Pétain is looking at maps, and he's already talking about abandoning Paris. He's already talking about the war maybe being over. Um, another Frenchman, a man by the name of General Ferdinand Foch, a man the British knew well and trusted, Foch walks into the room. He slams his fist on the desk, and he says, Paris is a long way off. We must fight right here. Um, one of the generals that was at the meeting says, we'll give the job to Foch. At least then we'll die with a sword in our hands. Perhaps not the imagery Foch had in mind. Uh, what comes out of this agreement is a deal that Foch will conduct what is called strategic direction of the Allied armies. What that means in practice is that Foch will direct the British American armies and the French armies where they should go, but it is up to those national commanders to actually do the commanding. So Foch is put in a position of trying to design a campaign without actually having any authority to give an order to anybody. And at this meeting, the French Prime Minister, Georges Clemenceau, turns to Foch and he says, now, General, you have it, the supreme command you always wanted. And Foch shoots back very quickly to Clemenceau. He says, it's a fine present you've made for me. You give me a battle lost, and now you expect me to win it. What Foch does for the first time on the Western Front is he understands that this all has to be considered as one front. And the only real power that he's given is something called the General Reserve. It's, it is, as the name implies, it's a reserve of troops that is kept back around here that is some French, some British. Eventually, the Americans throw a division or two in there. The only real power Foch has is where those troops go. That's it. And the interesting thing I find about Foch is that at the very worst of this crisis, when the Germans are approaching Paris this way, they're approaching Paris this way, 
it gets so bad that the French government leaves Paris and it goes to Bordeaux, far away in the southwest of France. Foch is in communication with his wife, who is living in Paris. And I found a letter and a communication exchange between the two of them where his wife writes to Foch and she says to him, the French government is leaving, everybody else is leaving, what should I do? And Foch writes this letter back to her in which he says, I have seen what there is to see, I have done what there is to do, stay there, I will stop them. So Foch is going to be a very, very important player in this, in this scenario. However, he does not command the French army. Command of the French army remains in the hands of Pétain. And as I'll show you, they are two very, very different people. The big question becomes, and it's a natural one, where do you think the Germans are going to attack next? If you're British, what do you think they're afraid of? Where do the British think the Germans are going to attack next? North or south? Obviously north. And this is Haig's big concern. He is worried about a drive through Flanders to cut off these channel ports, through which most of British supplies come. Without those channel ports, Haig can't supply his army. If you're Henri-Philippe Pétain, the commander of the French army, what are you afraid of? Where are they going to go? Paris. And this is the real concern that Foch has to manage. The British are right to be worried about the, the channel ports. Pétain is, of course, right to be worried about Paris. The question for Foch becomes, what do you do with these few divisions that are in that general reserve? Where do you send them? Do you send them north or do you send them south? And the controversial thing that Foch figures out, and I'll show you why he figures it out in a minute, is that the Germans are not going to go for Flanders and they're not going to go for Paris. Foch figures out that the place they're going to go is right there, along the line of the Marne River, right around here. A terrain that Foch knew very well because he fought in what was known as the First Battle of the Marne in 1914 and a terrain that Douglas Haig, the British commander, also knew from having fought there in 1914. And as we'll find out, the German commander, the Crown Prince Wilhelm, had fought there in 1914. Foch has figured out that this is where they're going to go next. What he has to do, however, is convince his subordinate commanders that he's got it right, because they don't believe him. The Germans had attacked here along the Aisne River, which is the, one of the rivers that flows right here. And they had created this little bulge, this little pocket, what in World War I terms is called a salient, uh, right along the Marne River. And this is where this battle is going to kick off in mid-July of 1918. This is where, how it looks up a little bit closer. There's your salient or your bubble there. This is what Foch has figured out. Paris is 103 kilometers away. It's pretty far away. Verdun, the great French fortress city, is 120 kilometers the other direction. There's Fim and Fimet, those two towns that I was talking about. There is your salient right there. What Foch had figured out, and it's not just him, it's his staff officers who had figured it out as well. What he's figured out is that this salient is absolutely untenable. The Germans cannot hold it. And the reason he has figured that out is because of the railroad lines. The railroad lines in this sector are what are called lateral railroad lines, meaning they run east to west, or they run against the grain of the salient, or excuse me, with the grain, parallel to the salient. What that means is that it's easy for the Germans to move supplies back and forth between Reims and Soissons, say, but it's extremely difficult for them to move supplies into this salient from north to south, which is what they're going to have to do. So what Foch has figured out is that in order for this salient to be tenable, the Germans have got to attack and capture the city of Reims, R-E-I-M-S, but the French pronounce it with a real nasal Reims. They're going to have to capture this rail juncture. If they capture this rail juncture, then they can do things. Until that time, however, their army is just sitting there. And he knows that there are two things the Germans are not going to do. They're not going to let that army sit there unsupplied, and they're sure as heck not going to withdraw it out of that salient. So what Foch has to do, what he has to convince his subordinate commanders of, is that the attack is not going to go west towards Paris. It is, in fact, going to go east or away from Paris. Now, this may be a prelude to an attack on Paris later, but the initial concern is not Paris. The initial concern is the town of Reims, the city of Reims. Now, inside the salient, as I'll explain in a little bit, this is a part of the battlefield that really has not been fought over very much. So again, there are very few trenches. 
Um, in fact, it has been fought over so little that most of the crops there are still growing. And that's going to become important. A lot of high wheat and a lot of high corn, which is going to make fighting in here extremely difficult. There are a couple of towns of note. The most important for our purposes is the town of Fair on Tardenois. There are also a number of farms that are going to end up being um, kind of fortified little mini fortresses on the battlefield as the Germans and allies alternatively um, do that. Bellow Wood is right here, the forest that the Marines defended just a couple of weeks earlier. The city of Chateau Thierry, another very important one for American military history, is right there. Um, all of this sector in here is what has to be defended. Now, what Foch has to do, and it's a little bit complicated, he not only has to convince his own staff officers that the Germans are going to go east, which seems counterintuitive to almost everybody. He has to convince Haig, and he has to convince Peyton. Haig still is worried about Flanders, for obvious reasons. Peyton is still worried about Paris, for obvious reasons. So Foch has to somehow convince them that he's got this picture right. The German commander, there he is. That is the Crown Prince Wilhelm, the Kaiser's son. Um, Wilhelm's an interesting guy because he's the Kaiser's son. He's made a colonel at age seven. Um, he is head of the Nationalist Militarist Party in Germany. And he is even more aggressive, even more militarist, even more expansionist than his famous father. In fact, his father was the one normally trying to calm his son down. Um, they didn't have the best of relationships. If the crown prince wanted to talk to his father, he had to set up an appointment through the royal calendar first. Um, but he's there. He's the Kaiser's eldest son. He's the future emperor, so they think of Germany. Um, and he has to be given an important role. So they give him command of an army group, which becomes known as Army Group Crown Prince Wilhelm. There are two crown princes. Um, he's Crown Prince Wilhelm. But what the German army has gotten in the habit of doing is bypassing him and working through his chief of staff, a man with a name you couldn't make up, um, a Prussian by the name of Schmidt von Nobelsdorf. And he's the guy they're going to work through. Um, the crown prince's reputation is that he's interested in chasing women and playing tennis, not necessarily in that order. Um, the crown prince, however, um, is a very interesting man. Throughout 1914 and 1915, he takes increasing interest in his own army group, takes over more and more of the responsibilities that his chief of staff had been doing. Um, he still plays a lot of tennis. He still chases a lot of women. Um, but he's taking very seriously what he's seeing. Um, in 1916, about midway through the Battle of Verdun, he becomes convinced that Germany can't win the war. He becomes convinced that they're going to lose. He tries to convince his father of this uh, to very little success. In 1918, um, he gets to be a little more optimistic as the Germans conduct those offensives in the spring. And he starts to think, well, maybe if things go right for us, maybe if we catch a break here or there, uh, we might be able to get out of this OK. Um, he had been the commander of the army group that was supposed to take Verdun in 1916. And as some of you probably know, he never got there. He sees taking Rance as a way to make up for the fact that he never did get Verdun. He understands full well the importance of Rance. It is a railroad center, and it is also the site of the coronation of French kings. So this is an important symbol, and it's an important military site. And he thinks if he can get it, maybe he can do something to help turn the war. Um, later on during this battle, he again becomes convinced that Germany won't win. He goes back to his pessimism um, and actually does uh, get an audience with his father and helps to convince his father that um, Germany's not going to win. But that's in the future. So how did the British, or excuse me, how did the French figure out that this was going to be uh, the attack. How did they figure out what the Germans were up to? Uh, there were a couple of signs. Um, there, were, uh, there was a concentration of German forces that the Crown Prince did, about 20 divisions in what became known as the Tardenois Plain, and about 22 divisions on the other side of Rance over here. Uh, that seemed to indicate to Foch pretty clearly that they weren't going to go west. If they were going to go west, those 20 divisions probably would have been over here, closer to Soissons. Um, and they certainly wouldn't have had 22 divisions over here. So it seemed to suggest to Foch that there was something else going on here. Um, the Germans also did a very poor job of what we in the United States now call OPSEC, or operational security. Uh, they did not change their codes. The French had broken several of them. There was an incident where a French, excuse me, a German officer had swum across the Marne River to scout positions. He scouted the positions beautifully enough and found what he was looking for, but the French found him. 
um, and he was carrying a complete set of the operations orders for the attack on him. Uh, in fact, there were so many indications and so many signs, Bosch's headquarters began to believe they were being tricked because it usually wasn't this easy to figure out what the Germans were doing. This was a little too easy. Uh, nevertheless, Bosch is convinced by what he's seen that the German attack is going to go for either side of Rance and meet somewhere around the town of Epernay, which is right here. Rantz and Epernay are the, um, the two French capitals of Champagne. So they, uh, if you want to go to France and you want to really enjoy and taste some Champagne, these are the two places to do it. Um, Foch believed they were going to go for both of those cities, not so much for the Champagne, though that's a really good reason in and of itself, but because if they get Rantz and Epernay, they also control this rail line. So the thinking again is they're going to want to take this entire rail system here. Now, looking at the map already, and I'll, we'll talk more about this, and this is where Colonel Johnson's book is so, so wonderful, Foch has figured out already two things. One, the key to beating the Germans is going to be stopping this offensive when it happens. Second, however, and very important for Foch's thinking and the way that his mindset works, if 20 divisions are going to go that way and 22 divisions are going to go that way, there's nothing right here. And what Foch is already thinking about is not just stopping the German offensive, but stopping it and then caving in the entire western half of this salient, because there's not going to be anything there to stop it. And this is really, really important to the overall story of the Second Marne. Foch is thinking from a very early stage, we're not just going to play defense, which is what we've been doing since March 21st. We're going to look for the point where we can stop the Germans and then turn the entire momentum of this war. And this is the place where we can do it if we play our cards right. His problem is that he's got two commanders underneath him who don't quite share his sentiment. The man on the right is by far the more famous. This is Henri Philippe Pétain, a man um, who becomes, much, uh, uh, becomes famous in World War I and, of course, becomes even more famous for his actions in World War II. Uh, Pétain's an interesting guy. He comes from the north of France from a peasant background. He despises all politicians, especially those that represent the French Republic. And in 1914, he is very much out of favor with the French army. The French army's doctrine has been preaching offensive, offensive, offensive. Pétain has been preaching defensive, defensive, defensive. And his famous maxim is le feu tue, firepower kills. That almost gets him retired out in 1914. But the experiences of World War I seem to suggest, and then really do suggest, that defense is in fact more important than the offense. Um, and Pétain quickly rises through the ranks. In 1916, he takes over command at Verdun, where he performs spectacularly well, becomes a household name in France, and becomes a tremendous hero. Pétain and Foch don't get along. Foch is an ardent Catholic. Pétain um, is a little bit suspicious of Catholics and their relationship to the French government. Foch is very much in favor of the offensive. Pétain very much in favor of the defensive. Um, they are two men that just don't quite see eye to eye on things. Um, and the command relationship, as I mentioned before, between these two guys is not quite clear. Foch is the overall commander of the Allied armies, or the coordinator, but Pétain is the one who's supposed to give the orders to the French army. So it's not quite clear even how these relationships are, are going to work. Um, the man on the left, probably less well known, this is Henri Jérôme, a very important man in his own right. Let me just sneak back here one slide, if I might. Jérôme is right here. He's commanding the Fourth Army right around Rance. So obviously, he's in a very important position here. Jérôme is um, one of my favorite French characters to talk about, or French generals to talk about. He's got this long beard and, and wonderful facial hair that he has here. He didn't look at the camera very often because he didn't like being photographed. Neither does Pétain. This is about as smiling as Pétain gets. Um, that's as happy as you'll ever see him. The other famous picture of him, he's literally growling at the camera. Um, really disliked all, all attention in that regard. Giraud had served in the Argonne Forest in 1914 when an artillery shell took off half of his arm and most of his leg. Um, he was then sent out to Gallipoli to serve as the French commander of that operation, um, which later is very, very important to this battle because he serves alongside a British general who had also been at Gallipoli. And the two men got to know each other quite well. Um, he's going to command the army that will later be over the American Rainbow Division, the 42nd Division. So he got to know a lot of Americans extremely well. After the war, 
he became the honorary commander of the Rainbows, a title that he kept until the day he died in, I believe, 1940. Um, it didn't get off to a good start, though. Giraud's driver, the first time he went to meet the 42nd Division, um, accidentally ran over one of the members of the Rainbow Division. So it didn't get off to a good start. Um, but Giraud met an officer from the 42nd Rainbow Division, a man by the name of Douglas MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur, uh, a man who um, didn't particularly like idiots, this is what MacArthur wrote about Henri Giraud. With one arm gone and half a leg missing, with his red beard glittering in the sunlight, the jaunty rake of his cocked hat, and the oratorical brilliance of his resonant voice, his impact was overwhelming. He seemed almost to be the reincarnation of that legendary figure of battle and romance, Henri of Navarre. And he was just as good as he looked. I have known all of the modern French commanders, and many were great when measured by any standard, but he was the greatest of them all. Giraud was without a weakness. So what was it that this man did that was so important to MacArthur? This is what he did, and let me walk, it, you walk it through this with you uh, very quickly. Giraud was trained in the old French army system, which means attack, 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 attack. Offensive à outrance, offensive to the utmost. When in doubt, attack something. Giraud, however, figures out by 1915, maybe that artillery shell did it for him, that that's not going to work to win this war. And Giraud and Pétain together come up with a system that is going to become known as the defense in depth. Other armies had done this before, but it's Giraud and Pétain that perfect it. And let me just explain to you um, what the system looks like. This right here is my vain, weak attempt to show trenches. That's what those are. They look like them. Come on. These things right here are called communication trenches. They are designed to move supplies forward and move wounded men backward. And these things out here are saps, little listening posts out into no man's land. The way a defense in depth system works when it's done right is the men in the first line, very, very few for a division, two regiments out there and very few heavy weapons, a couple of machine guns and that's about it. These guys are to sit and take on the brunt of the first wave of the enemy offensive. Sound like a good job? Very little heavy weaponry and very few men. In fact, it becomes known as the sacrificial trench. Now, their job is a very interesting one. They are not to sit and fight the Germans to the last man, as would have been the case in 1915. Their job by 1918 is to hold the Germans off long enough to break off the timing of their offensive. And I'll explain why that's so important in a little bit. Break the timing of their offensive fire flares into the air to indicate where the main lines of the German attack are coming from, and at the last minute, spike your own weapons and get out of there. The men in the sacrificial trenches were all volunteers. Nobody was forced to serve in the sacrificial trenches. Why did they do it? Excellent question. I looked high and low for a single memoir, letter, diary from any man who had served in here. Couldn't find one. My best guess is this is the equivalent of falling on a grenade to save your buddies. Okay. Their job is to fight as hard as you can, slow the German offensive, don't defeat it, that's not your job, spike your weapons, and get out of there. Georges Clemenceau, the French Prime Minister, walked into one of these sacrificial trenches just a couple weeks before the battle, and he wrote, he who has not lived through such moments does not know what life can give. The second line, the combat zone. These are the guys who are supposed to fight the enemy. And to explain this, I got to explain a little bit about how a World War I battle typically functioned. It functioned with something called a rolling barrage. What this was, was an artillery fire that the Germans would fire at the French trenches. And the idea was that the, the artillery would precede the infantry by a measured pace. And the idea was that as the artillery moved, the infantry would move as well. And that was the way you were going to get protection to the infantry. So the goal here is for the men in the sacrificial trenches to break up that timing so that the artillery barrage rolls away from the infantry and therefore makes it less powerful, makes it irrelevant. Then the German attack would have to fight through the sacrificial trenches without artillery support and then come to the second line, the combat zone, where you have your fresh troops and most of your machine guns and heavy weaponry. Now the theory is the Germans get to here without artillery support and already tired from having fought through one line. Now they've got to fight the second line. And if by chance they manage to make it through the second line, there's the third line. And if they make it through the third line in Giraud's district, 
there's a fourth line, and in places there's a fifth line. All without artillery support. That's what Giro has put in place. What Giro has done is try to create the situation whereby the German attack is going to fail. And again, I think the thing that, that men like Giro and Ferdinand Foch and others deserve great credit for is taking the system that they were trained under, this offensive, offensive, offensive system, and saying to themselves, this doesn't work. We need to do something else. And then figuring out what that something else is going to be. So late on the night of July 14th, the French have worked this out so well, the whole German plan so well, that late on the night of July 14th, the French staff can send out the following coded message. Francois 5-7-0, which tells the Allied units that the enemy attack will begin at 10 minutes past midnight. That's how well they've got it figured out. Then, after that, are the following two words. Bonne chance. Good luck. Okay. So the next morning, July 15th, the Germans go on the attack. They're expecting to capture all of this stuff here in this area called the Montagne de Rance. What they get instead is what's in that red circle, a small bridgehead around the town of Dormans. That's it. That's it. What the Allies did, the German attack was scheduled to begin 10 minutes after midnight. Guess when the Allies began their attack? Midnight on the dot. Okay. 10 minutes before. Where do they aim the artillery fire? The German front lines, because that's where they know the German soldiers are going to be, and the German supply areas and their communication trenches. Okay. So what happens to the German artillery barrage? It's going to do nothing. This is a German soldier, Kurt Hesche. Um, I looked at my watch. It was midnight. Was our artillery mistaken? It was not supposed to commence its fire until 10 past. I jumped out of my shell hole to look around. Shells were falling in front of us and in back of us, but it was the enemy who had commenced. Can he leave on time out of his trenches? He's going to watch. He actually describes it. He's going to stand there and watch the German artillery roll away. Is there time to set up a new artillery plan? No. Is it in German nature to say, well, the artillery rolled away. We better not attack? No. They're going to have to go anyway without that support. So what happens? They attack here around Rance. They come here around Dormans. All they can do is get across the river and hold a very, very small bridgehead. Giraud can claim, rightly so, that his fourth army on this day did not have a single man lost POW and did not lose a single artillery piece or machine gun. That's how well the system works. Giraud writes this, and I, I think it's just beautiful, so I'm going to read it real quick here. This is Giraud's order of the day at the end of the day on July 15th. Soldiers of the fourth army, you broke the effort of 15 German divisions supported by 10 others. Their orders were to cross the Marne, but you stopped them. You have the right to be proud. You heroic soldiers and machine gunners of the forward posts who signaled the attack by shooting those flares and broke it up, in other words, the men in the sacrificial trenches, aviators who flew overhead, battalions and batteries who destroyed it, staff officers who so minutely prepared the battlefield. This was a hard blow to the enemy. This was a great day for France. I count on you to act in the same way every time the enemy dares to attack. And from my soldier's heart, I thank you. One more from that same German soldier, Rudolf Bending, who wrote this in his diary at the end of the day. I have lived through the most disheartening day of the war. The French deliberately lured us. They put up no resistance in front. Our guns bombarded empty trenches. Our gas shells gassed empty artillery positions. We did not see a single dead Frenchman, let alone a captured artillery gun or machine gun. We have suffered heavy losses. Everything seems to go wrong. Today has been the most severe defeat of the war for Germany. Now, is Foch happy with that? Nope. Now comes what he's been waiting to do since he took the job in March. He wants to cave in this entire Western front. There's Foch on the right. Ferdinand Foch from down by Spain, down in the Pyrenees. Very interesting guy in his own right, but I don't have a whole lot of time to get into it. The guy I want to talk about is the man on the left, Charles Mongin, nicknamed the butcher. The word to eat in French is manger. His nickname was the eater of men, Mongin. Okay. If you got put in his army group, you pretty much looked down it as a death sentence. Mongin was a very interesting guy. He got a lot of men killed. He, his famous statement is, well, whatever you do, you lose a lot of men. That was his offensive doctrine. 
Moshan had served in Senegal in the years before the war and had somehow developed the theory that Africans didn't feel pain the way that Europeans did. So Moshan developed something he called La Force Noire, the dark force, the black force. And the idea was to create an army filled with Senegalese soldiers. And he does this, and they fight extremely well in World War I. The one thing I'll give Charles Mongen, he is the only four-star general I know of in World War I, and I'm happy to stand corrected, who led charges by himself, had personally led charges, on the theory that he would not ask his soldiers to do anything that he wouldn't do. Now, he's twice been kicked out of the French army, not kicked out, but reassigned, because he's just, his offensives are just too costly. Foch brings him back. Foch wants him because he wants somebody extremely offensive and aggressive to handle the next part of the offensive that Foch has in mind. Mojan's a very, very interesting guy. There's a lot more to get into with him, but maybe in the Q&A here. What Foch wants to do, he stopped that. He wants this. He wants a three-pronged, three-army offensive. He wants Mojan's army to go for Soissons, he wants de Goot's army to come up here, and he wants Mitri's army to meet somewhere around Ferron Tardenois. He wants to break this entire western part of the salient. Now, the forces that he has in hand here are multinational. The armies are French, but the units underneath them are American. There are four British divisions, and there are two Italian divisions. So what you have is this weird Tower of Babel situation that Foch has found, where they're speaking English, French, Italian. The people that are doing most of the transportation are from Vietnam, so they're speaking Vietnamese as well. And they've got African soldiers who are speaking no less than six African languages. And Foch is trying to command all of this. And what he's trying to do is get divisions in the right place at the right time. So it's not uncommon for a British division, say, to think it's going over here to the Fourth Army and find out it's been rerouted to the Sixth. Show up in the Sixth Army area, and there's no one there to greet them. There's no maps. There's no anything. So what do you do? Run towards the sound of the guns. So you read a lot of memoirs and diaries of guys, especially in British units, saying, hey, we showed up around Dormans. There's nobody to meet us. There's no maps. There's no nothing. What are they doing? What Foch is trying to do is get as many men on the outside of this perimeter as he can, knowing that this has failed and the Germans probably aren't going to try it again. What he's going to do is put uh, several divisions the American 1st goes under De Goot 6th. The American 28th, the Pennsylvanians, go under Mitri's here in the 9th. He's putting them all over here, just putting them wherever he can put them. The French 10th Army alone is 16 infantry divisions, 1,500 artillery pieces, 346 tanks, and 581 airplanes. That's a serious combat formation. The German 7th, opposite them, is eight divisions, most of whom are supposed to be resting from their experience recently in Russia. 700 artillery pieces, no tanks, although they do have some air power underneath them. The important thing that I do want to point out here, because it's an issue that always comes up when talking about the Americans, the Americans had said that they would not serve underneath foreign commanders. Pershing says, we'll do it at the divisional level at this battle. That is, a French army commander can give an order to an American division commander, but the American division commander will say where and when our troops fight. And he attaches a condition to this. If this works and we do well, you give me my own part of the Western Front. You get us out of this situation once the emergency's passed, and you give me my own section on the Western Front. And that's the deal that they cut. Terrain here, as I said, there were no uh, trenches or very few trenches. Michael led me on a beautiful staff ride through Gettysburg today with the wonderful rolling hills of Pennsylvania. Not dissimilar terrain here, except with very high, tall crops. A lot of ravines, a lot of very steep, deep ravines, and a lot of high crops into which the Germans hide machine guns. So if you think about Pickett's Charge, but think about it going up against 30 caliber water-cooled machine guns that can fire 600 rounds a minute, that's what you're getting here. So the initial attack here in the west, as you can see, works well. And after a couple of days, by the 27th of July, the Allies have taken all of this territory in here. It works very, very well. The Germans are caught flat-footed. The Allies are able to cave this in. Then it starts getting difficult. The German army is extremely good at moving around what is known as interior lines. Remember what I told you about those rail lines? So it's easy to move units and assets from the east over to the west in order to kind of shore up a falling position. 
So what you see here are a lot of small unit actions that ironically enough, and almost everybody comments on this, it looks like the war they were trained to fight before 1914. Open warfare, no trenches. It's the war they thought they were supposed to fight in 1914. They just never got until now. And you read especially British commanders saying, hey, we had to go back to our 1914 manuals. All those things we were supposed to have thrown away, we were scrambling to find copies of it. How do you fight open warfare? How do you fight leapfrog, cover, and fire kinds of things like the French have been doing? How do you do that? So this works extraordinarily well. Let's take this. But going up through these towns, going up through these farms, especially Croix Rouge Farm, Sergi trades hands something like seven times in a single day. And marching up through these ravines gets extremely difficult and extremely bloody. And this is where a lot, especially of the American units, make the mistakes that units that haven't been fighting for a long time make. They overrun German positions too quickly, which allows the Germans to plant machine guns actually behind them and fire into their backs. Um, a lot of lessons that the Americans have to learn the hard way. By July 27th, though, they are moving up this way. They are coming up around the town of Bouzancy, which has a chateau there that becomes the scene of a, of a battle between the Scots in the 15th Scottish Division and a German unit. If you go there today, there's a beautiful little memorial that says in French, there's a rose uh, planted there. Uh, sorry, it's a, it's a heather, this Scottish heather that's planted there. And it says, here will always bloom a Scottish heather amid the roses of France. Very poetic, very French. Uh, but this is a multinational battle that is being orchestrated by Foch very, very carefully. All right, let's wrap it up just a little bit here so we can get on to Q&A here. A couple of things that are very, very important to note. As we get closer and closer to August, Foch has decided that this battle has done what it was supposed to do. It has achieved what Foch calls the culminating point, which means that it has stopped the German offensive and it has allowed the Allies to resume the offensive themselves. It's done what it needed to do. Uh, one other factor just to point out here. This is the Aisne River right here. This is the river along which the French Army had mutinied in 1917. There are big hills right up in here. I can talk more about it in the Q&A. Pétain had stepped in to stop those mutinies and get the French Army back to fighting position. He has no interest in going back up into the Aisne Valley. So by early August, Foch invites, quote unquote, Douglas Haig to conduct his own offensive, which is going to become the offensive at Amiens, which kicks off on 8 August 1918, uh, which leads the British in a very British kind of way. They count August 8, 1918 to November 11th, the signing of the armistice, as the 100 days to victory. One of the things I've been desperately trying to convince audiences of when I speak about this in Europe is we need to throw that idea out the window and start with Second Marne, and we should talk about the 119 days to victory. I have yet to find a Brit who will agree. Um, I've got some French people convinced, though. No surprise. Uh, look at the youth of the POWs here. The Allies capture POWs that they think are as young as 14 or 15. There's no real way to prove that, but it indicates to Allied officers just how drained down um, the German army is becoming. 35,000 German POW. Anybody know what happens at Amiens? The famous phrase that's always linked to the Battle of Amiens. 8 August 1918, the Germans take 20,000 POWs. That is 20,000 Germans surrender. This news gets back to Eric Ludendorff, the commander of the German army, the quartermaster general, and he says this is the black day of the German army. And every book you will see written by a Brit, Colonel Johnson shaking his head, so I'm assuming I got this right. If you can find me a book about 1918 written by a Brit that doesn't have that phrase in it, I'll give you a buck. Okay, the black day of the German army. Well, twice as many German soldiers surrender at Second Marne than surrender at Amiens. And as I tell my British audiences, I spoke on this in England, this is not to denigrate the British. There were four British divisions at this battle too. It is just to say that the turning point of 1918 is Second Marne, it is not Amiens. 612 German artillery pieces. How are they gonna make new artillery pieces? They aren't. They're at the limits of what they can do industrially. How about the Allies? What if they lose an artillery piece? We got American and French factories still firing them out, so it's not a big deal. 3,300 machine guns, which are also pretty awful. The Kaiser um, and the Crown Prince have a meeting. Crown Prince has to tell his father that 20 German infantry divisions are off the order of battle. They no longer exist. They're gone. Okay. It is that night that the Kaiser records, actually one of the Kaiser's aides records in his diary that the Kaiser had a series of nightmares in which he was going to have to face all of his royal cousins from around Europe and admit that he had caused all of this damage. So the German system is beginning a little bit 
um, to unravel. I want to make um, three conclusions on this before I get to your uh, questions and answer. This is a cartoon from the British satirical magazine Punch. Um, there's the Kaiser with his ridiculous mustaches there that became so cartoonish. Um, this offensive, as I told you, happened in Champagne country. So the caption reads, a Champagne counteroffensive very much up. The bottle of Champagne is getting the Kaiser right in the eye. And the Champagne bottle reads, Foshin Company. Um, on July 24th, if I've got my memory serving me right here, uh, Foch calls a meeting of the commanders of the Allied armies. Pershing's there, Pétain's there, Haig's there. This is what he tells them. He says, the Allied armies arrive at the turning point of the war. Engaged now in battle, they have seized the initiative of operations from the enemy. Here's the important part. Oh, it is 24th. It's right on my slide. Way to go, Mike. The moment has come to abandon the general defensive attitude forced upon, forced upon us until now by numerical inferiority and pass to the offensive. What he's telling his subordinate commanders at this meeting is, don't worry about being attacked by the Germans again. They're not going to do it. It's our turn. It's our turn. He tells Pershing, you're going to get your sector that you wanted. You're going to clear the San Miguel salient. And then it's going to be up to you to figure out where to go next. That eventually becomes the Musargon offensive after some debate and some trial and tribulation. I want to make three quick points here, if I may, uh, to conclude. The first is, is a notion of what the Allies and what the Germans are trying to do in 1918. In 1918, the Germans are attacking, 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 with no larger sense of what these attacks are supposed to do. Ludendorff's famous phrase, another one of his famous phrases, we're going to punch a hole. After that, we'll see. On the other hand, Foch decides very shortly after this meeting of the conditions that he will accept for a German armistice. Foch says, if I can get the terms I want, nobody has any right to spill another drop of blood. In other words, the Allies, led by Foch, are fighting this war to get the war over with on conditions favorable to them, even if it means that the war ends on French and Belgian soil, which of course it does. The Germans, on the other hand, are continuing to fight with no real strategic goal in mind. Second, another pet rock of mine. You cannot, cannot, cannot write the French army out of this war after 1917, as far too many historians have done. 100 divisions on the Western Front. The largest army is French. This battle, the overall strategic coordination is French. All of the army commanders are French. The bulk of the soldiers are French. The bulk of the equipment is French. The tanks the Americans drive, the airplanes they fly, the machine guns they shoot are all French. You can't write the French out of this war. And that's something I'd be happy to talk about in Q&A. It's very interesting when you read memoirs written right after the war, the British cannot say enough nice things about the French. In the 1930s, when you read memoirs written by the same people, they can't say enough bad things about the French. But that comes later. That comes in the 30s. And Michael said he's got a great repertoire of French jokes if you need them. Third, this battle stresses to me the diversity and the complexity of the First World War. If you think about the First World War simply as trenches, simply as over the top first guy to Berlin wins, if your vision is only the Battle of the Somme, only the Battle of Passchendaele, you're missing the incredible diversity and complexity that this war could bring out. This battle, the second Battle of the Marne in 1918, looks nothing like the first Battle of the Marne in 1914. It is as if they came from two different centuries. And that has to be appreciated. So to sum up, I'm going to use a quotation. I'm going to paraphrase a quotation from Winston Churchill, who's always great for quotations, who said something about El Alamein that I'm going to paraphrase for the First World War in 1918. Before the Second Marne, there were no victories. After the Second Marne, there were no defeats. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take your questions. It's just in Giro's first line, in those sacrificial trenches. Well, compared to that, would you talk about the uh, rifle companies of the 28th Division that were uh, along the Marne, 109th and 310th, two companies each, and, and what became that at the end of the day on the 15th? I'm going to actually say the expert, the man who really knows that, if I can pass it on to Colonel Johnson, is sitting right there who wrote the part about the American part. Do you want to handle that one, or do you want... That's the expert. That's the man sitting right there. <laughs>
Uh, actually, that, that's a little bit out of my sector, but, but, the, but the answer is, in part, uh, they acquitted themselves extraordinarily well. Uh, they, too, uncharacteristic in terms of American experience, were deployed in depth, uh, a completely foreign concept to them. And uh, it's, it's interesting to get into the memoirs of, of that particular unit, that, that the regiments involved there, and they come out uh, bloody, but very proud of what they've done, and they've done a really pretty spectacular job. It, it is the sense of the French that the Americans are very good soldiers. They just don't know what they're doing. And the, the famous phrase from the French uh, soldier, who one of the French attaches, who says, "This is magnificent, but it's not war." You know th that kind of a of an attitude. And there is a statement Charles Summerall makes it, where he's asked if his unit can attack again, and he says, um, "Sir, when my army only has two men left, we'll be echeloned in depth and headed towards Berlin." And the French hear things like this, and they just go, "You know, you know." But you know, this, this is kind of characteristic of the Americans, and they do. They equip themselves quite well. The Germans are a little baffled. They can't, they can't quite believe the Americans are attacking the way the Americans are attacking. You know, they're not doing things the way the French and British do, and it's extremely costly, but it, it works. They're from Pennsylvania. Of course they follow. Uh, based on uh, some of the things you said, it seemed like Foch understood logistics maybe a little better yeah. than previous Americans. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, Foch is, is a staff officer par excellence, as I think Douglas Haig is. I think you know, people that describe Haig as a cavalryman don't really understand. Haig is a staff officer before he's anything else. Foch is the same way. Um, and Foch certainly understands that, that moving units on a, on a board isn't quite the same as getting them in place where they need to be gotten to. He's willing to take a lot of chances in this campaign, pushing units to get there before their artillery is there, before their machine guns are there. Because he has this intuitive sense that this is going to change things, and we can't miss it. You know, rather get 75% of our strength there now than 100% of our strength there in three days when the Germans react. Um, but I, I think to understand the, these senior officers in, in, in any war, but I think World War I, it's probably truer than most. The ones that succeed at the senior level are the guys that understand that staff work. And I think understanding them, as you sometimes see, well, Foch is an artilleryman and, and Haig's a cavalryman, I think that misses the point. You know, these are people that know how to build the staff. And as I've argued in another book, the, the successful commanders in World War I all have excellent staff, chiefs of staff underneath them. And Foch's is a guy by the name of Maxime Wagon, who turns out to be a terrible commander in World War II, but is an excellent at taking, like Foch, Foch was just fond of saying, well, we're going to move this army here. And then it's Wagon that sits down and says, all right, well, how do we get an entire army <laughs> from there to there? Right? And the same thing is true of the successful British commanders. I mean, if you look at the great British commanders, it's really the staff guys underneath them that have the great reputations. And very often, when those staff guys go somewhere else, there goes the reputation of the senior general as well. That's why these guys, like you look at people like Tim Harrington in the British Army and Wagon in the French, George Marshall in the American, they never get commands of their own because they're too valuable in the jobs that they're holding. You gonna tell me I was wrong on everything? No. I thought you were going to say that. Can you talk about the uh, Persians' uh, reaction to participation in and uh, assessment of the American performance? Yeah, Pershing's an interesting character. I mean, he's stubborn as a mule, as you all probably know. Um, Pershing goes to France with a letter from Woodrow Wilson. Um, and the letter says that Americans will only take commands from Americans. So whenever uh, Pershing is pressed, he just takes out that letter and he says, you know, my commander in chief tells me this. Um, on the other hand, when the crisis hits in March of, of 20, uh, March 21st of 1918, I forget the exact date, um, he goes to Foch in his very bad French and he says, um, infantry, what is it, the Americans would consider it a great honor to be in this battle. Infantry, artillery, armor, everything we have is yours. Use it as you wish. Um, and so Pershing is this very kind of, I think, very hard to read kind of character. Um, on one day, he's telling Foch, well, if you have to abandon Paris, fine, but my Americans aren't going to serve under your French generals. And the next day, he's saying, hey, take everything I got. You know, when you need it, you need it. Um, and and this, this is the case at the Second Marne. I mean, the Americans are, are commanded at the division level, but all the staff work is done by French officers. And, and my sense of it, and I, you know, he, Pershing never says this, um, but my sense of it is that Pershing realized pretty quickly that his staff work was not up to 1918 standards. Uh, and that putting American troops under French army commanders would save American lives. And that's why he did it. Uh, now, once that was done, he certainly wanted his own sector and his own staff and his own everything. Uh, but it's my sense that at Second Marne, he fully well understood. If he let the Americans do all the staff work, it was going to go very, very badly. And, and you know, say what you want about the French. 
1918, they've got staff work down. They may not have had other things down, but they knew how to move things. They knew their own rail system. They knew their own logistics system. There was simply no point asking Americans who didn't speak the language, didn't know the culture, didn't know the terrain, and asking those guys to come in and do that kind of stuff. Um, so I think Pershing in that case deserves some credit for being a modicum of flexibility. But as soon as this is over, I mean, he goes to Foch and he says, you know, I did what I did. I did what I said I would do. Now you've got to create my army. And, and Foch, uh, Foch actually says something to him along the lines of, um, today I'm going to be more American than any of you. You know, we're going to create an American first army. So. Pershing actually got along better with Peyton than he did with Foch. They became very good friends. It's kind of a strange friendship. It sounds like during the um, Allied counterattack phase that for one of the first times in the war, the Allies could mass their attacking forces more quickly and in greater force than the Germans can react defensively. Yeah. I think that's right. I think it's a factor of, it's a function of two things. It's a factor of the German system breaking down. And the Crown Prince is aware of this. When they do the attack on Rance, he writes uh, in his orders, uh, I'm sorry, in his diary, he writes, this is the last attack my army group is capable of. Because he's aware of, of just, I mean, those great German offensives, those great German um, captures of all that allied territory are also the days when the German army suffers by far its highest casualties of the war. So they're, they're moving forward, but at a terrible, terrible human cost. So on the one hand, the German system is breaking down. On the other hand, Foch is pushing the allied system really to the maximum of its envelope. And he's, that's why, again, these units show up with no maps, no guides, no interpreters, um, no heavy artillery, no medical corps, no, no, no anything. Um, but because he pushes, they're able to get that concentration of force at decisive points. And then when the Germans do begin to react to it, that's when it evens out and you see this kind of slower advance that you see in Second Mart. And that's when Foch says, all right, it's time to spring a surprise on them somewhere else. And that's when Amiens happens. But you're absolutely right. And I think it's another one of my pet rocks when I teach this to undergraduates who somehow have this vision in their head that the German army never makes a mistake. Well, they make a ton of them. And they certainly are making more and more and more as 1918 goes on. And the, 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 the interesting thing is they're aware of it. And the Crown Prince especially is saying, we're not the army that we once were. This isn't what we were commanding even six months ago. Uh, the Jura objective originally was uh, red. And then what's, what was their overall objective once they, they got there? Yeah, it's actually unclear. Um, typical in, in the way that the Germans do things, this uh, Obstrug tactic, um, they never really lay out what it is they're attempting to do. Um, Two theories. Uh, one is that after capturing Rance, they were going to build up their supplies in that salient and then make their big push for Paris. That's certainly what the, the French think. Uh, the other one that's a little bit better supported by the evidence is they were going to capture Rance, force the General Reserve to come in that direction, and then strike in Flanders, a project that becomes known as Operation Hagen. Um, and Hagen's on the table until you know, very late July. I mean, Ludendorff goes north. Ludendorff's actually not in Second Mart. He's in the north overseeing Hagen. And it, it, takes him a it takes a long time to convince Ludendorff, you can't do that. We've just suffered this massive setback. You can't do it. Uh, but the, 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 thinking, the thinking among the Allies certainly was that they're going to rebuild and go after Paris. The evidence seems to me to suggest they were, in fact, going to hit Flanders as soon as they had gotten that general reserve pulled to the south. And Hagen, of course, never happens. But it's, it's very unclear. It's an excellent question, because they're not sure themselves what it is they're trying to do. First of all, I'd like to thank you for one of the most concise and uh, pointed lectures that we've heard here, at least I've heard. Thanks. Uh, my question is, is um, what, uh, how important would a, how decisive would a, would a French loss have been? And uh, could you please elaborate somewhat and put the uh, battle war in context in the sense of the German army had definitely, obviously peaked perhaps uh, a year or so before. And was obviously in a very steep decline. How did, in, in, in that context, how decisive was this battle? And would not the increased weakening of the German urban army manifest itself sooner or later, as it did in the you August know, 8th example, or at a similar point? I think you're probably right. I think sooner or later the Germans were gonna were gonna make a mistake like the ones that they made here on the Marne. Um, what I think you have happening here is is number one, the weakening of the German army. And second, the arrival of the Americans. And I'm not one that's going to stand up and say the Americans came in and won the war. I don't believe that to be true. But the arrival of the, the equivalent of a division a day 
allows the French to take risks they might not otherwise have made. And this is another point Foch realizes. As long as the Americans are going to land 22, 23,000 men a day, Paris is safe. The Germans aren't going to get to it. Right? You may not be able to count on the Americans to do a very sophisticated combined arms, whatever, but they can sit and garrison Paris and the fortresses in Paris. No problem. So, and if you know that Paris is safe, then you're free to go ahead and take some gambles in ways that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise. And they're actually, you read some French memoirs where they're actually really angry that the Americans are coming because it means the Americans are going to go into quiet sectors like the area around Meuse-Argon, and those French soldiers are going to go into the active sectors. So they see the Americans coming and they say, oh, there goes my period in the Vosges, you know, the nice, quiet, beautiful Vosges Mountains. That's over. Now I'm going to get shifted up, you know, north. I'm going to get shifted into fight somewhere, somewhere else. Um, so I, I think it's, I do think the German army is certainly weakening itself. The difference between the, the, um, the Allied armies and the German armies is this infusion of blood. And it, it's, an, it's an imagery that everybody uses. Uh, Pershing at one time notes he's not very happy with it, but there is a, a transfusion of blood coming. You know, French blood is continuing to weaken, British blood is continuing to weaken, but here come these Americans. And they may not quite know what they're doing, but we'll teach them. You know, they'll, they'll figure it out. Um, and I think that that gives them both a little bit of hope, it gives them a morale boost, and it, it allows Foch to do things he could never have done otherwise. I was thinking this might be a case of where the turning point of the war has already transpired, neither on side knows it yet. Um, I think, you know, you read the stuff that the Germans are writing um, from the Chancellor on down, they figure out pretty quickly Second Martin is what's done it. And I didn't bring the quotations with me, but George von Hertling, um, who was the German Chancellor, before Second Marne, he writes this thing where he says, in 90 days, they're going to come to us with peace terms. And then right after Second Marne, he says, the hope of the world ended. Like, you know, we're done. We're going to lose this. Um, and they realize pretty quickly. And it's at this point, this early point, when Ludendorff's already thinking, well, how do I get us out of this? And the way to get us out of this is to figure out somebody else that we can blame. And Ludendorff's a big proponent of that so-called stab in the back myth. And how do we guarantee it so the armistice is signed before they put a soldier on German soil? Those are the two things we need to do. And then at the end of the war, of course, he gets the armistice. He doesn't actually negotiate it. He puts on a disguise and runs to Sweden. Um, and then develops his own weird Nordic religion to replace Christianity and then, you know, all the other weird things that, that come out of that. Um, so th that starts early on. I think Second Marne is what convinces the Germans, we're not going to get to Paris, we're not going to get to the Channel Ports. And if we don't get to those two things quickly, we're not going to win. We've got to think of some other way out of this because we're not going to win on the battlefield. And they believe before Second Marne that they will, they will do just that that they're that much better, smarter, faster, whatever, than the Allies. But I think Second Martin is what convinces them it's not going to happen. We've got to think of something else. Here comes Louise with the hard question. A year or so prior to this battle, you had mentioned in your talk that the French army, had, at least portions of it, had essentially along that line yeah. beyond mutiny. Within a year, the civil government has undergone a change, and the military leadership has undergone a, a significant change on the French side. But as I, we all we all know that, that the French people can be a little bit skeptical at best about everything except their champagne, their wine, and their freaks. To what degree do you see this series of events following the German offensive being stopped, the allies taking the offensive? To what degree do you see that filtering down to help a turnaround in the home front attitude and the amount of support that the average person behind the lines was giving to the war effort. Great question. Um, the French mutinies are extraordinarily complicated. Um, essentially what the French soldiers say is we're not going to attack again under these stupid suicidal conditions. Um, we will defend France, but we're not going to attack again until you figure out a better way. And essentially what they say is we're willing to die, but we're not willing to throw our lives away for nothing. Um, what you see in 1918 is, to my mind, fascinating. You see these attacks on France leading to a tremendous upsurge in morale, where the French soldiers are saying, look, they're doing it again to France. They're despoiling more of our territory. They're uprooting more refugees. We're not doing anything to stop it. 
Um, the interesting thing, this is the point, again, that I always make to students and to uh, my, my friends who tell lots of French jokes, like Michael, wherever he ran off to. Um, remember, France is completely irrelevant to the causes of World War I. It's a shooting in the Balkans that leads to a crisis in the Balkans. The French didn't want this war. The French weren't supporting this war. Um, the French had actually ordered all French troops to back off 10 kilometers from the front so that nothing would happen accidentally. Um, the way the French look at this, they've been attacked. They've been, you know, a third of their land, most of it, the key agricultural, uh, excuse me, the key industrial parts of France have been destroyed for a cause that had nothing to do with them whatsoever. Um, and I think that leads to two things. It leads to a certain demoralization of, you know, what has happened to us and why. But it also led to, uh, by 1918, a tremendous desire to say, okay, this is going to stop and it's going to stop here. And I think that the, the renewal of the German offensives, ironically enough, leads to an uptick in, in French morale, not a downturn. And it, it doesn't sound like that should be the case, but um, you can read virtually, the only testimonial I found against that was one uh, French peasant who told an American soldier, why are you here? You're only going to prolong the war. And then the French, the American soldier um, actually says, I don't know what to make of this because you don't see this in the, quote, more intelligent French people, end quote. And I don't really know what to make of that. Um, almost any other memoir, memoir diary, including some of the ones I read over there, um, people are saying that, that the French, French people and French soldiers are more committed to winning this than ever. Yeah, the mutinies are a fascinating, fascinating thing. In your formal presentation, you hinted that you might like to be asked about a coach so you could talk about him as a person. But well, I am a great straight gal, so I will ask you about Great, thank you. Also, I'd like to know what in his background made him what he was, and how would you compare him to somebody in time who would be yeah. Is there, like Eisenhower, maybe? Yeah, in fact, I think Eisenhower is a perfect, perfect case. Let me, uh, let me explain a little bit about Foch first. Um, there is a picture postcard that I found from 1914, which has a picture of all of the um, senior Allied generals, British and French, from 1914. And Foch is hiding way in the background because he was commander of one of the armies at the, at the Marne. The interesting thing I think about this postcard is that of all the men that are pictured on this postcard in 1914, Foch is the only one still holding a command in 1918. So the question is, why him? Um, I think there are two things about Foch, maybe three, that um, make him kind of stand out. The first of those um, is that Foch had no interest whatsoever in the French Empire in the 1870s, 80s, 90s. Never served in the empire, never asked to serve in the empire, didn't care about the empire. Um, all he cared about was Germany. All he cared about was understanding the German way of war, the way the Germans thought, the way they attacked, the way they defended. He's the only one of the senior French generals that never served in the empire. Um, so when this war comes, he feels as though this is the moment he's been waiting for his entire life. This is what he's prepared for. Um, and for the most part, he reads the Germans uncannily well. Um, the second element of this, uh, Foch was, like many senior French officers, a very devout Catholic. And of course, the French government was very avowedly anti-clerical, which puts him at odds with the politicians more than once in his career. But I think it gave him um, a, a faith that he could pull on when he needed to. And his letters are very interesting. He, he asked his wife not to keep most of their letters. She burned most of them. So we don't have those letters. Um, but you, you do hear people referring to Foch um, as the phrase they use as a fighting priest. Um, his headquarters more than once is described as the monastery. Um, and I don't think that's meant derogatorily. It's meant to show a, 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 a sense of faith that he has, that France will win this, and that he'll play a part in it. And the third thing that I think Foch does that most other generals don't do, Foch is very, or way, even before the war, Foch has figured out that if France is going to beat Germany, which is more populous, um, more industrial, and more geared toward war, being in a, in a dictatorship or monarchy, than France could ever be in a republic, if France is going to win, it's going to need allies. And Foch, way before the war even begins, is courting the British tremendously. And he becomes extremely close friends, so close that it, it, it worries people on both sides of the channel with a British general, Henry Wilson. Um, they, they each go to the other daughter's wedding. Um, they get very, very close. In fact, they used to run around the staff room together trading hats. And you know, people thought this was just kind of, they shouldn't be this close. Um, and it's Foch that, that convinced the British. Um, Wilson asks him something like, well, if a war does start between us, um, you know, the Royal Navy will protect you. And Foch says, I don't care about the Royal Navy. I want one British soldier on the continent. 
And what he meant by that was, if one British soldier is committed, the British nation will have to commit everything. Um, and so Foch, this is where I think the Eisenhower parallel is very good. Foch figures out pretty quickly, um, if a multinational coalition is what you need, the only way to make it work is to let the nations do what the nations do, which is why Foch never gives a direct order to Haig, never gives a direct order to Pershing. Um, he gives a few to Peyton. Peyton ignores a lot of them. And then Clemenceau sits Peyton down and says, I have more faith in Foch's judgment than I do in yours. You're going to listen to what he tells you. Um, and you know, that's an interesting relationship, too, because Clemenceau was, was incredibly anti-clerical. Foch was a, dev a, dev a devout Catholic. He and Clemenceau were as you know, oil and water as two people could possibly be. Um, but I think Foch had that figured out from the start. He understands. Americans will fight better under an American flag and American officers. However, you can't put the Americans at risk by letting them go with the staff work that they do. Um, and in that regard, I do think Eisenhower's command is, is a pretty good example. Um, what's that great quote? Someone else might have it from Eisenhower when someone refers to a British son of a bitch or a British bastard in the command. And Eisenhower's supposed to have said something like, well, yes, there are a lot of bastards in my command, but it's not because he's British or something like that. You know, call the man a bastard if you will. But, <laughs> you know, Foch has that same kind of an attitude. Um, he doesn't have quite the elaborate Cossack system that, not Cossack in the Russian sense, but, you know, chief of staff of, combined chief of staff, whatever the acronym stands for. Foch doesn't do anything quite that sophisticated, but the same spirit is there. He's a fascinating, fascinating guy. And because he didn't leave a very detailed diary, and he didn't write his memoirs he wrote, but they're very, they're very officious. Um, and he didn't leave letters behind. It's, it's kind of hard to get to know that man, because he didn't let a lot of people get too close to him. So he's interesting in that regard. He hated politicians, too. He was asked many times to run for president of France. And he gave some version of, you know, I'd sooner hang myself you know, every time he was asked. <laughs> it's interesting. They all did. Pershing never ran for president. Haig never ran for prime minister. I mean, none of those guys when they could have had public office, took it. And Peyton in 1940 only took it under the most dire of circumstances. They all loathed politicians and wanted nothing to do with the world of politics. Uh, other than perhaps uh, not always being ready for prime time, could you characterize uh, American officers, say, at the regimental and brigade level? Um, inexperienced, certainly. Um, aggressive, brave to a fault is a, a phrase that the British and French both use. Um, eager to learn. I think this is something we also forget. Uh, an excellent book by a friend of mine, Robert Bruce, of how anxious the American officers were to learn. And the army they wanted to learn from was not the British. It was the French. And when they could, from the Australians, with whom they got along extraordinarily well, breaking the Hindenburg Line and some other operations that they worked on together. Um, they learned from the French. They figured out pretty quickly, and I think Bo's book makes this pretty clear, um, that the British system was not the one that was going to teach them what they needed to do. The French system was more sophisticated. Um, it used the weapons that they used. It used the system that they understood. Um, this gets back to my pet peeve about all of this, that the negative stuff about the French is, is 1930s and after. When you read these guys' memoirs, like the thing I read from MacArthur, you know, I mean, they can't say enough good things about the French army, about how wonderful it did. I mean, Churchill starts his memoirs of World War II by saying the rock we all built upon was the French army. Right? Now, 1940 proves that that may not have been what you thought it was, but that doesn't change the fact of what it actually was in the war years. And, and this kind of knocking down the French has become um, you know, a little cottage industry. And it's just understanding what that country went through in a war that wasn't theirs to fight. I know that doesn't answer your question, but, uh, but you should talk to Colonel Johnson, who's right in front of you, who knows so much more about this than I do. <laughs> Can I just say one last thing? I'd also like to thank Michael for um, a year and a half ago when he first invited me to do this, um, having the forethought to understand that Bruce Springsteen would be in Hershey last night so I could go. So thank you, Michael, very much for that as well. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, Dr. Weinberg, this has been a, been a real treat for all of us. Uh, those of us who spend a lot of time 30 miles from Gettysburg spend a lot of time with the Civil War. Those of us who have an interest in the Second World War also spend a lot of time reading about it and enjoying it. And in some ways, we may say that the First World War is one of those forgotten because the, the literature is so much smaller in relation to the, to the other wars. There are so many few
you were historians working on it. But what you've done for us tonight is, is bring a small aspect of that, of that war to the front and allow us to think about something that perhaps most of us haven't thought about very deeply at all. We, we really appreciate that. If you come out here, I'd like to present you a, a reduced copy of your, uh, your oh, book beautiful. from outside. This is beautiful. As a, as a token of thanks from, uh, from all of the, uh, the APEC staff. It's been a thrill to have you it's here. It's a pleasure to be here. A, uh, a uh, great, uh, great historian. We all uh, know and respect uh, Dr. Dennis Showalter. It's called Dr. Nyberg and Michael Howard of his generation. High praise indeed, and I think tonight's uh, presentation really proves that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael.